Thank you uh, very much uh, for those observations. Vice Chancellor, thank you very much for your generous introduction. I was so enjoying your generous introduction that I was thinking perhaps you could just go on for the full hour about my virtues and I could not give a uh, speech. Uh, that was enormously thoughtful and I'm enormously grateful uh, to you. The only thing that is as impressive as the hospitality that the University of Mumbai is showing me is the beauty of this remarkable structure and this remarkable convention hall uh, in which I have an opportunity uh, to speak. And I shall always remember my opportunity uh, to uh, speak here. What I'd like to do today is three things. I'd like to tell you why I think the quality of universities determines the fate of nations. Then I'd like to tell you about what I think are some lessons from American higher education, where the United States has, I think, been very successful in many respects in higher education. And then I'd like to discuss a number of common challenges that are faced by universities here and universities uh, in the United States. Start with this. George Washington founded our country. George Washington was our first president. When he was completing his presidency, it was time for him to give the nation a farewell address as he went into the twilight. The subject that he wanted to give his farewell address on was a proposal that America form a national university. Alexander Hamilton persuaded him that he had to reflect on the broader lessons of the revolution. So that was not, in fact, his farewell address. But what he had originally written in his farewell address, he had in his last will and testament. Think about it. The founder of the United States, as his last major public statement, wanted to talk about the importance of establishing a great university. And what reasons did he give? His reasons resonate remarkably well today. He talked about how the relationships that people formed with each other in the late years of their adolescence, the early years of their adulthood, were relationships that would stand the test of a lifetime. And that providing institutions which, in which people from every part of our country, in which people of every background would come together, would knit the fabric of a nation together, would connect those who would go on to lead that nation. He spoke about how universities were engines of opportunity. His successor, Thomas Jefferson, spoke about the idea of an aristocracy of talent. The idea was that no matter where you were born, no matter who your parents were, you should be able to realize all of your potential. You should be able to be educated and develop skills to the full extent of what is possible for you. I read again 
recently the story of Ramanujan. And I thought to myself, how many Ramanujans are there in the United States? How many Ramanujans are there in India whose talent was never discovered and whose talent was never developed? And it is the quality of a quality and extent of a university of a, of a nation's universities that determine whether those opportunities are provided for all. When George Washington spoke about the importance of a national university, he did not neglect the practical and institutions in which science and technology would be developed, in which skills would be taught that would enable the active and vigorous pursuit of prosperity. George Washington was perhaps our second greatest president. Our greatest president was Abraham Lincoln. And in the middle of the Civil War, he put forth a substantial political effort to establish what were then called the land-grant colleges and what are today called our great public universities, the University of Michigan, the University of Illinois, the universities of many different states. And those institutions got their start in agricultural science, in developing effective technologies and techniques for agriculture, and in disseminating those technologies. And so too today, the prosperity of nations is tied up with the success of their universities. It is no accident that Silicon Valley is essentially in the same place as Stanford University. It is no accident that the city of Boston, where I live, is where Harvard University is and is also the leading concentration of biomedical talent in the United States. And one could give example after example. Manufacturing institutes at the University of Michigan that both supported the automobile industry and were supported by the automobile industry through the middle part of the 20th uh, century. So universities are crucial as sources of prosperity. Universities, too, are sources of global influence and global connection. Those who study the United States and speak about what I'm most proud of as an American, the soft power we have achieved as, nation, as a nation, highlight our good fortune in having dozens of our universities be among the top 100 universities in the world. And I have seen my, I have seen the influence that great universities can have in forging global connection. Again and again, everywhere I go, as a U.S. government official, as a person working in the private sector, Someone tells me about, I spent a year at Harvard University in 1969 and it changed my life. I have always thought differently about the United States since the two years I spent at the University of Pennsylvania in the mid-1980s. Universities forge connections that are of immense value. This was brought home to me uh, some years ago 
when, during the time when I was president of Harvard, when I was told a story. There was a Russian submarine that had encountered some major engineering flaw and found itself on the bottom of the sea with 120 crewmen, with sufficient air for six days. It was not within the capacity of the Russian Navy to rescue that submarine. There are absolute rules that if you are in the Russian military, you are not supposed to have friends and call people in the American military. But it turned out that in one of Harvard's schools, there had been a program, a two-week program in education and in values for the military that had brought together senior U.S. military officials and senior Russian military officials. Because of a personal connection made in those programs, Russian, the Russian Navy, reached out to the American Navy, and it was possible to do something. And those 120 crewmen are now alive to see their children. And for a time, at least, that common project of rescuing that crew brought the United States and Russia closer together. Finally, finally, universities are repositories of wisdom in our society. I saw a number of you nodding and agreeing, and you were, I think, right to agree when I talked about universities as engines of prosperity, and I talked about the importance of science and uh, technology. But that cannot be and is not all or even what is most important about what universities represent. I will never forget many years ago reading a biography of your Prime Minister Nehru and learning about how, when he was imprisoned, he wrote a history of the world for the benefit of his daughter. And I thought to myself, what a rare political leader it is who could dream of writing a history of the world. And what an extraordinary political leader it was who could write a history of the world in a prison cell without access to a library. And surely, without that learning and without that knowledge, he would not have been able to do all that he did. And if our societies are to be wise as well as smart, profound as well as effective, that too will depend on the job that their universities do. George Washington recognized all of that. Thomas Jefferson as he approached his last days, was told that there was room to record only so much on his tombstone. That his tombstone would record that he wrote the Declaration of Independence. That his tombstone would record his central role in the founding of a new nation, 
and that there would be room for only one more thing. It could be that he was, for eight years, President of the United States, or it could be that he was the founder of the University of Virginia. Jefferson chose to have it recorded that he was the founder of the University of Virginia. Now, I know that it is fashionable to argue that prosperity comes from the ground up, and it does. But when it is suggested that that somehow means that primary and secondary education should be a focus to the exclusion of higher education, I would suggest that that is a grave and enormous error. No matter how universal literacy is, no matter how many people have been taught arithmetic, no matter how healthy all the children are, a society will not move forward without learning that touches the frontiers of what man knows and without being part of the adventure of pushing back those frontiers. And that, I would suggest, is the work of universities. And so if I ask myself, where will India be in 2050? That is not something that any of us can know. But I am confident of this. India will not be great without great universities. And if India has five of the world's 100 greatest universities in 2050, I would be very surprised if this next long generation has not been one of vast social progress on every other dimension in India. So my first point, what happens in higher education is probably as or more important than what happens in any other sector, because it is higher education that will determine whether there are doctors who are well-trained. It is higher education who will determine whether there are teachers who lead education forward. It is higher education who will determine whether there is cutting-edge science and technology. It is higher education that uh, will uh, determine whether are those who have the capacity to lead, manage, grow, and change large enterprises that are major enterprises for job creation. What's involved in success in higher education? In many ways, it's, of course, a matter of detail. It's having good curriculums. It's having motivated faculty. It's having wise admissions procedures. But I would suggest that there are some larger and broader lessons that are essential to think about in thinking about what makes a successful academic institution. And I hope you'll pardon me if in describing these lessons, I draw on my own experiences at, uh, in the United States and particularly at Harvard. And I would suggest five aspects that if one keeps these five aspects in mind, they will help one think through almost every question that comes up in reforming higher education. First, the right academic culture. Here's what I believe is the mark of a great university. A great university 
is governed by the authority of ideas rather than by the idea of authority. It is a place where any question can be raised and any individual can be challenged. I was reminded of this um, years ago when I was president of uh, Harvard. I taught a seminar each fall for freshmen. And there were 15 students, 18 year olds in my seminar. And my seminar was in my field of ac academic expertise, global finance. And it was an introduction to global finance. And we would discuss a range of global financial issues. And the way I organized the class was I assigned readings. And at each class, the students would begin by one of the students would be asked to present and critique a set of articles. And for one class, I only did this once, I engaged in the standard professed professorial vanity of assigning a lecture that I had given during my time as Treasury Secretary that represented my attempt to distill what I knew about global financial crises from the various issues that I had been involved in that the Vice Chancellor described. And this young man was going to the readings, and he said, and then there was Professor Summers' reading. It was kind of interesting, but the data really didn't at all prove the conclusions. And I thought to myself, what a fantastic thing it was. I didn't think he was right, he was wrong, but I thought to myself, what a fantastic thing it is that here it is, I'm the guy who has the title president. He's been here for six weeks, he's 18 years old. I'm talking about what I knew as the Minister of Finance of the United States. He's a kid and he feels completely comfortable saying I'm all wrong. What a fantastic thing it is that we're a place where that can happen. And how many other human institutions are there where that can happen? And that disdain for prerogative, that openness to challenge, that willingness to discuss every idea is the mark of any great university. And if one doesn't have a culture and a set of supports for that, very little else will matter. Second, autonomy. You cannot run a system of higher education the way you run an army. The right way to run an army is for every soldier everywhere to have the same definition of what it means to stand at attention, to have the same rifle, to load it in the same way, to be able to adopt the same standard formations. Indeed, I would say autonomy is catastrophe when it comes to organizing a military. But when it comes to allowing education to flourish, autonomy is essential. That is the only way you have experimentation. That is the only way you have change. That is the only way you have motivated actors. You know, and perhaps this is an observation that has resonance that goes beyond higher education. There is a concept of reform and there is a concept of liberalization and they are not the same thing. Sometimes the right thing to do is to govern better 
Sometimes the right thing to do is to govern less. And those are not the same thing either. And so I would suggest a second requisite of building a great higher education system is allowing it to be autonomous, to set its own course. Institutions like the University of California, which are comfortably in those top 100 institutions, they are public institutions, they are controlled by the legislature, they derive substantial part of their funds from the state budget. But no governor or senator has anything to say about who will be on the faculty. No governor or senator has anything to say about what constitutes an appropriate uh, curriculum. No governor or uh, legislator has the slightest thing to say about which fields of inquiry the university will make a special focus. Autonomy is a second requisite of success. Here's a third requisite of, uh, of uh, success. Competition, fierce competition. This week, Harvard will, actually not this week, actually it's in, in, in the relevant thing is in several months. At the beginning of April, Harvard will admit students. And Harvard will then watch anxiously to see what fraction of the students we admitted, who Yale also admitted, or who Stanford also admitted, will choose to come to Harvard. If the fraction who came to Harvard is higher than it was last year, we will feel good. If the fraction has declined significantly, we will think it is a catastrophe. A catastrophe. Because that means we are losing in competition. People are choosing to go elsewhere. It was not uncommon when I was president of Harvard for a very distinguished professor to get an offer from an outside university where he, would, he or she would be paid 50% more than what was their previous salary. And if the professor was indeed distinguished, without thought, I would say that we should match that 50% increase in salary. We did not have any kind of fixed scale. We had a market and we competed and our objective was to be the best. Sometimes it was infuriating to have to pay more in salaries. Sometimes I remember thinking when I would make a third phone call to some graduate student who was deciding whether to go to Harvard or to MIT, I would think, why am I prostrating myself trying to recruit this graduate student? And then I would remember the vigorous competition was the Darwinian mechanism for pushing towards excellence and being the best. Culture, autonomy, competition, these are crucial requisites of uh, success. I'm only going to highlight one more. And that is worldliness. American universities are not hermetically sealed. Yes, we call them ivory towers, but in many ways, they're not. Our medical school faculty are in hospitals treating patients every day. Our economics faculty, like me, take time away from the university to serve in public office or to advise government officials in our country or beyond. 
We do not regard ourselves as finished with our alumni on the day they graduate. We constantly are inviting them back to our campus to learn from what they are doing, teaching, practicing law, working in business, social organizing, whatever it is. And we do that mostly because we have a lot that we can learn from our alumni. But we do that also because we are interested in them and we hope that they will be interested in us. And we certainly do seek to develop a philanthropic tradition in which those whose lives have been enriched and transformed by the opportunity to attend our university see fit if they have been fortunate in life to do things to support our university. It didn't used to be true, but it is the case today that our public universities, as well as our private universities, seek to inculcate that financial virtue, that financial commitment in our alumni. And last, and very important, we are not cheap. Our judgment is that the only thing that is more expensive than a university of education is the lack of a university education. That if we provide better university educations, the amount that we will add to our students' well-being will rise over time and enable them to repay what they owe. It is short-sighted in the extreme to hold down the quality and investment in education simply so as to hold down tuition costs. Yes, it is absolutely essential to provide financial aid for those who require it in order to attend higher education. And probably the thing I'm proudest of having done during my time as president of Harvard was to have instituted a policy in which every student with a family income under $60,000 didn't have to pay anything at all to attend Harvard University. But for those whose families can pay, they should. And for those who are going to be transformed and have a world of great opportunity after they graduate, they can pay us back as well. Short-sighted holding down costs for everyone is the way to constrict supply, limit quality, and ensure mediocrity. It is the wrong way forward. I would say to you that you show me a country in which Universities have a culture that ignores prerogative and venerates truth, where universities are able to make their decisions autonomously, but in the knowledge that the decisions they make will have consequences because they are in fierce competition for the best students and the best faculty. Where they can use that autonomy and competition not just to build the best ivory tower, but to make the biggest difference in uh, the world. And I will show you a country that has a first-rate higher education system that is making an enormous contribution to its national development. The third thing I wanted to talk about today, just a few of the common challenges that are faced 
by universities in my country and by universities in uh, your country. Or maybe I should say challenges and opportunities. The most important one by far, the one that has the potential to be both disruptive and transformative, is technology. Think about this. In almost everything, we think about getting to massive scale and providing for individual customization as being in conflict. If you're going to build four million cars, you can't build a different one for every person. But it's the remarkable feature of education technology that on the one hand, it has what economists call a zero marginal cost. Once I've made my, once I've filmed my introductory economics course and it's been put on the web, it can be watched by a million people just as easily as it can be watched by a hundred people. So on the one hand, there is the capacity for reaching vast scale, far more people than can be put in a lecture room. On the other hand, what information technology makes possible is much more customization. If you didn't quite understand what I was saying when I was talking about competition, you can't, you've missed it. On the other hand, if this were a information technology supported class, there'd be no problem in your winding the tape back and listening to that three times if you found it worth listening to. In traditional education, I have to design a set of problems to teach someone microeconomic theory, and I sort of make a judgment about what the best problems are for the students. Wouldn't it be much better to give everybody the same three problems, and then the students who had trouble got a next set of problems that were easier, and the students who answered quickly and comfortably got a next set of problems that were harder. What technology makes possible is both customization and large scale. There is no reason in today's world why Ramanujan, wherever he is, cannot on a cell phone be learning what Hardy knows about mathematics. And the institutions that will have the greatest impact over the next 50 years in higher education will not actually be the ones with the most vibrant campuses. They will be the ones that are the center of the creation of the best courses. I've seen it in a small way already. My wife is an expert uh, in American poetry and a professor of poetry at Harvard. In the typical year at Harvard, she teaches about 85 students in several classes. She has taught an online course on American poetry not just by filming her teaching a class, but she's gone to Emily Dickinson's house and filmed at Emily Dickinson's house, discussed Langston Hughes' poetry with Bill Clinton, and so forth. 15,000 people last year watched her online course. That's five lifetimes of teaching students in front of her in a classroom. Whoever can develop the best such materials 
will change the world. And think about how much more vibrant the educational experience on a campus can be if instead of everybody coming in and sitting on a small chair while somebody gives a big lecture, everybody watches the video at a time of their choosing by themselves, and then when they're in the classroom, they're all engaged in discussion and debate and actively learning rather than passively learning. You know, it was a great revelation to people when the movie was first invented. When the movie was first invented, people's idea was that what you would do is you would put on a play and you'd put a camera in back and film it. And then people realized that really with cameras, video cameras, there was something to do that was much, much better than filming a play. Well, there's going to be things that are much better to do than filming a lecture. And whoever does them best in first is going to be able to touch the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people. And by the way, if you're concerned about the economics of higher education, remember, an iPad costs next to nothing. And with an iPad, you can have access to the best courses produced by every university on this planet. Now, how's it going to happen? Who's going to give degrees? How's there going to be certification? How are you going to do tests without cheating? There are a lot of questions, just as there were a lot of questions when the first films got invented, just as there were a lot of questions when the car got invented about how was there going to be roads, and who were we going to certify people uh, to drive. But we are on the brink of a seismic event in higher education through the use of technology. And any institution that is not heavily focused on what its strategy involving technology is, is, I believe, missing the chance to be part of the adventure of its times. Second, science and technology and uh, prosperity. Silicon Valley, Bollywood, Boston in the biomedical sciences. Turns out that, though you'd never think it would be true, that almost all the small aircraft produced in the United States are produced in or near Wichita, Kansas. And there are dozens more examples, and I'm sure there are examples in India as well that I don't know. Clusters of knowledge and expertise are engines of prosperity. And the center of the creation of that knowledge can be and should be universities. You know, one feature of our modern age is that there's much more capacity for the division of labor than there ever has been before. And what that means is that strategy is going to increasingly be not about compensating for weakness, but about building on strength. And so how universities engage with science is a crucial question. And it is a crucial question for governments as well. There's another thing that is part of understanding why American universities have been so successful. And that is a decision that was made after the Second World War under the influence of a man named Vannevar Bush. And his idea was that the government needed to support basic research because 
who else would? It doesn't pay any company to develop quantum mechanics because it won't be able to capture the benefits once quantum mechanics are discovered. And so government needs to support basic research. But how should it decide where the basic research is going to be done? If it's left to the Ministry of Finance, it will be, you know how it will be decided. There'll be some of it in each state, some of it in each university, more of it for those who are better able to lobby, more of it for those who are better connected. And so, we instituted a system known as peer review. Groups of scientists evaluate each other's proposals, and the ones that rank best are the ones that get funded. Now, do the scientists ever log roll each other? I'll support your proposal if you'll support my proposal. Yes, they do. Does a process of letting scientists determine what's the best science guide resources much better than a process of letting politicians determine what's the best connected science? Yes, I would submit that it surely does. And so a strong commitment to funding basic research is, I would suggest, a second crucial effective requisite. Third, we live in an era of global connection. And here I come to an issue where I think India is falling far, far short of its potential. We in the United States think of higher education as a traded good, as a tradable. 200,000 students each year come from the rest of the world to study at American universities. They pay tuition to the American universities. They buy food at American restaurants. They buy lodging from American in, uh, in American apartments. They buy clothing in American uh, stores. They are an engine for our economy. Some of them stay and drive our economy forward. Some of them go home and never forget the importance of economic links with the United States. And so we American universities think of our openness as a great strength. I was sort of blown away by the sense of small world uh, that I had when earlier today I had an opportunity to uh, meet uh, with someone who remarked that her son had been a friend of my son at the small college in Maine that they both attended. And I thought, what a fantastic thing that was. Well, I am here to tell you that higher education should be a major Indian export. I cannot think of a better place abroad for an American student to study than India. Fantastic intellectual resources. The English language is spoken. The experience of being in this country, your country, is a more enriching and broadening one for an American, I can tell you, than the experience of being in Manchester, England, or Sydney, Australia, or Auckland, New Zealand, or many of the places that our students study. Here's the bad news. You have, I would estimate, 200 times 
the population of New Zealand in India. But more American students studied abroad last year in New Zealand than studied abroad in India. And that is, some of it is their fault that they don't have the imagination and vision to see how much they could gain from studying here. But frankly, more of it is your fault that you do not provide the opportunities, you do not structure the programs, you do not look outside, you do not understand the ways in which it would augment India's soft power to have 10,000 of the most talented American 21-year-olds spending six months or a year in your country every year. Before too long, one of them would be President of the United States. And what a difference that would make for relations between our two countries. Well before that, one of them would found a technology company that was worth tens of billions of dollars and would think differently about India because of what she saw when she was here. Not to mention, I can assure you, without going into details, as an economist, that we could find a figure that would look like a very high tuition figure to the vice chancellor here, and would look like a very low tuition figure to me as a parent of an American student. And it is a huge opportunity. And it is one that American universities are taking advantage of too slowly. But it is one that, frankly, you are taking advantage of glacially. And I believe you can do better. Now, there are two ways of responding to what I just said. One way, which would be the, I think, natural Indian impulse, would be we should have a government program to recruit foreign students and we should get all the universities involved and we should launch a big armada and every university is now going to have a program to try to reach out to have students and the rules and there are these 97 rules designed to ensure that no American student ever took a slot that could otherwise have gone to an Indian uh, student and we'll have a planning committee to establish the framework committee which will establish the implementation program which perhaps will go into effect in 2024. That is a possible way in which it could happen. I would suggest that if you heeded what I just what, heeded what I said earlier, autonomy, competition, flexibility, and you just let any, any university that wanted to experiment with this idea and keep any money it got by doing the experiment, you'd get there a lot faster. Because some people would fail and some people would succeed and the people who succeeded would get copied and matters would uh, move uh, forward. Globalization, science and technology, distance, edu distance uh, education, these are crucial parts of the challenge of higher education. But ultimately, it's about a teacher setting on fire the curiosity and creativity of a young person. And those of us who devoted our lives to universities have done it in large part because we know that the most malleable part of a person's life is the years around when they attend university. That whatever you learn before you're 15, you can unlearn. And none of us actually change our minds about very much after we're 30 years old. 
And so what happens in those years matters more than anything else. That's why I've spent my time in universities. That's why I felt so honored to have the opportunity for some number of years to lead a university. That's why I envy the students here their opportunity to continue to study at a university. And that's why I say to all of you who have a chance to be involved in setting the policies and direction of this university and of higher education in India, you have a great and sacred mission. Godspeed. Thank you very much.